Today, we're going to talk about beer. Specifically, gender in beer. Wait, don't go. I swear this is a fascinating story. We're going to talk about how beer used to be made and how something as simple as hops says something about gender. So this is a story I've been harassing friends in the bar with uh, probably for the last three years. I think any of you who drinks with me has probably heard this story multiple times by now. Beer holds a special place in our society. As far as we can tell, our species likely first introduction to alcohol, save maybe chowing down on some rotten fruit. Estimates show beer may be more than 10,000 years old. Heck, we just uncovered a very ancient Middle Eastern brewery with a link in the description for you to check out. And why does it enjoy so much popularity? Well, first of all, it tastes good and you can make it with some of the earliest ingredients our species ever learned to farm. It has much of the nutrition and calories of bread, but is drinkable. It's like gogurt, but booze. Second, alcohol is a drug that makes you feel good. That is up until you have too much and it makes you feel very not good. Drugging our brains has been shown to be a universally desired experience and not just from humans. Animals get drunk all the time. Just watch this video by Art Explains in the card or the description to learn just about that. Lastly, we don't appreciate this much today with our modern sewage systems and such, but water used to be a bit of a gamble. Diseases such as cholera made drinking water kind of dangerous and Brewing it into beer was an easy way to disinfect water before drinking. So yeah, for a long time, beer was a household staple enjoyed by the whole family. For the sake of honesty, beer back then had much less alcohol and as some food historians have found by recreating recipes, not super flavorful, but it was beer nonetheless. And so to begin our story about gender, the home is where we need to start. Beer wasn't a luxury product. It was as much a part of the average household as salt and pepper are today. And the people back then would probably kill for salt and pepper. Funny how things change. So beer was very much associated with home and the domestic sphere, which given the delineation of labor in much of the past meant brewing became a job for women. We even see many cases in European and Middle Eastern mythology, goddesses of beer. The beer women made in this period was a simple unhopped ale that spoiled quickly, so it wasn't feasible to centralize production. That meant beer was often brewed at home. Some brewsters, which is the feminine word for a brewer, would sell their excess beer and make a bit of profit. Many women who didn't have the burdens of a family in Europe became masters of their craft. We have lots of records of medieval nuns who became famous brewsters. One of the most famous being St. Hildegard of Bingen. Ironically for this story, one of her significant contributions was to suggest using an herb called hops as a preservative and to improve the beer's flavor. And here's where the real kicker came. As beer gained a longer shelf life, the process became more centralized. And since it was a staple of the house, profitable. Also, in order to keep prices low, governments passed laws like the Reinsheitsgebot. Reins, Reinsheitsgebot. Reinheitsgebot. We'll go with that one, which standardized beer recipes for centuries as requiring the use of only barley and hops, outlawing other herbs and grains. It was an effort to keep the grains used to make food, especially wheat, from use in brewing. It was an effort to keep food prices low. However, those who produced beer at home, who had a menagerie of different ingredients used in their brew, were disproportionately affected. These laws muscled beer brewing out of the hands of women in order to ensure commercial success for large, centralized, all-male brewing guilds. Soon it was relatively rare for women to brew at all, and even today beer has gained a sort of masculine identity. And this didn't happen without coercion. Churches began to write sermons about how women had no place in commerce, and many of the icons associated with prominent Brewsters began to take on sinister connotations. Brewsters used to make beer in frothing cauldrons and hang a broom outside their doors to indicate whether they had any available for sale. Oftentimes, the grain they used attracted mice, 
and so they owned cats as pest control. Also, since women are shorter than men and they wanted to stand out at the market, they'd wear tall pointy hats to- Okay, I think you know where we're going with this. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog too. <laughs> Witches have so many gender dynamics to unpack. I think they should be a video of their own for the future. But yeah, it's super not surprising these icons became associated with witchcraft. And not too long after these purity laws went into place, massive witch hunts happened across Europe. During these witch hunts, influential hunters and small communities accused over 200,000 women of witchcraft. Given how hops as part of the purity law act as a kind of symbol of the male takeover of brewing from women, I can't help but think the modern day craft beer and the arms race of hoppy beers have more than a little of a gendered aspect to it. But there's hope for change. Women are getting more into the craft beer scene in the last few years, and we've even started to see the slightest hints of beer made without hops, called Gruet, entering the market. Now, this sort of gender story is not new. We've seen stuff such as this happen with women's domains as soon as they become profitable throughout history. One example often brought up is midwifery. There used to be a whole industry of midwives who'd help women with their pregnancies and giving birth. As medicine became more professionalized, childbirth became medicalized, and doctors went to pretty far lengths to push these women out of the delivery room. However, midwives do seem to be making a little bit of a comeback. A more recent example is computer coding. Early on, before there were even computers, women often did secretarial work, which involved mass amounts of computations. These women were literally called computers. As computer the machines developed, the male engineers really only cared about developing new hardware and considered the actual writing of code, the software, as a side priority they could give to their mostly female secretaries. As software started to show more promise, men entered the scene, pushed women out, and coding even built a reputation that it's some sort of masculine activity women aren't even good at doing. Stereotypes, which still block a lot of women going into the field today. Makes you think how gender runs deep in our culture. Aspects of society your favorite current voice professor might say is baked into human biology turn out to be way younger than you think they are, and capable of change. It's almost as if it's some form of, dare I say, social construct. I want to thank U of T professor and food historian Jeffrey Pilcher, whose talk I listened to before I even started Step Back led to the creation of this video. He also agreed to review the script, which was pretty cool. This video is one I've wanted to make for a very long time. Thank you 12 Tone for the theme, as well as my patrons Don and Carrie Johnson, Michael Kirshner, Scott Smith, Luis Inez Guarita, Mary D'Onofrio, James McNeese, and Garrett Kwan. Like, share, subscribe, and come back for more Step Back.